found in tonight's facts is this humble joint of beef for the chop. Does the first magic trick lie under one of these cups? What part does this man play on TV? Who will be the next star of this gong show? These and lots more questions you want answered by Bill Oddy, Wendy Leavesley, and Mr. Trivia, Billy Butler. Thank you very much. Thank you, and welcome to the very last facts. Now, today is, of course, Friday, March the 7th, and on this date in 1897, cornflakes were first introduced to the world by John and Will Kellogg. They were two brothers who were vegetarians and Seventh-day Adventists, and they ran Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan, and they invented cornflakes as a health food. And on the 7th of March, 1935, 50-year-old Malcolm Campbell improved on his own world land speed record for the eighth time. He took the record in 1924 in Bluebird, when he reached 146.16 miles per hour. But 51 years ago today, he was up to 276.82 miles per hour. And by the 3rd of September the same year, he topped 300 miles per hour. 301.129 to be exact. And the official land speed record currently stands at a staggering 633.468 miles an hour, achieved by Richard Noble in Thrust 2 on the 4th of October 1983, which came as a great shock to his wife. They're only going shopping. <laughs> Right, now we kick off with the historical question. Katie Salt of Bury St Edmunds wants to know, how did sirloin get its name? Well, Katie, to find out, we sent our reporter, Wendy Leversley, back to the 17th century. It is the big event in Lancashire, in this the year 1617. The visit to Horton Tower it can James the Sixth and First. The royal party are expected to stay for several days of fun and feasting. And Bluff Dick to Horton is reported to have pulled out all the stops to impress His Majesty, who is arriving now. King James, could you give a few words to Fax News, please? Oh, no, 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 Wendy, there's no time for interviews. Us kings haven't the time to spare. There's a lot at stake here. Get it? <laughs> Onward, lads! Dick! Oh. As well as being fond of meat, the king is a great sportsman. He and Bluff Dick are planning to hunt all day. King James is set on bagging a deer. But if there's no stag today, there'll certainly be a real stag night tonight. The de Hortons are well known for their lavish hospitality. Just look at this dining table. It was brought into the room as a whole oak tree and made on the spot. You can imagine the scene when the king and his party sit down to wine and dine at this evening's mighty bash. Henry VIII, what's the penalty for having six wives? He said, Definitely. six mothers-in-law. Oh. <laughs> yeah. What do you think of my beef? Your beef, Dick, the oh. finest beef I've ever tasted. Bring, bring on, on the beef. The beef. Let... More beef for the king. Come on, bring on the beef. This beef, beef. The beef. The beef. This beef is so oh. good, I'm going to make it a member of the aristocracy. Oh. Arise, sirloin! Arise, sirloin! God save the king! God save the king! <laughs> Bluff Dick, can you pay the bills? Hmm. Difficult. It's going to cost a great deal of money. I fear that it may mean a year in the fleet prison. Your Majesty, can you tell me, did you enjoy the evening? Aye, Selina, it was a great night. We wined, we dined, we had a ball, we even break danced. Are you aware that it's cost Bluff Dick a small fortune to entertain? Debbie, what's money when you're entertaining the King of England? And I've set up a wee bit of history here today. I knighted a loin of beef, and you never know, lass, it might be on television in the future. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before your very eyes, some prestidigitation, or conjuring to you lot. Michelle Williams from Reading asks, what is the oldest known magical trick? Well, Michelle, the oldest trick known to magicians is the cups and balls. Performing it can be traced way back through the ages. 
It was even found inscribed on the walls of the burial chamber in Beni Hassan, Egypt in 2500 BC. And artists have often depicted conjurers performing the cups and balls trick. And the most famous of these is a 15th century painting called The Juggler by Hieronymus Bosch. Now notice the pickpocket in the left foreground, because it's often been suggested that conjurers and pickpockets would work together. While the conjurer grabbed the attention of the crowd, his accomplice would grab what he could from the pockets of the spectators. And even after thousands of years, this trick is still performed today. So, to show us a modern version, we've invited back magician Wayne Dobson without his pickpocket. Yes? <laughs> yes, this is uh, the world's oldest trick, and uh, they used to sit round carpets cross-legged, but times have changed. We have a table and three copper cups. They used to have walnut shells and a pea. Uh, <coughs> Bill, if you'd like to have a look at these cups, make sure there's nothing inside them apart from the bottom. Nope. Okay, nothing in that one. Okay, no. nothing in that. And uh, nothing in that, okay? Right, okay? What we'll do also, apart from that, we need three small balls, all right? right? The reason I have three small balls is there's one ball for each cup. You gathered that, okay? I'll let you do the honors of placing the balls on top of each cup. All right. Mind you, that's on the bottom because the cups are upside down, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> is that okay. what you want? That's fine, that's right, perfect. Okay. Also, for the trick, we need this. This is a magic wand, all right? This is cup number one, two, and three. We'll do a little trick. You've got to keep one eye on the cups, one eye on the balls, and one eye on me. <coughs> <laughs> if you can do that, we've all got problems, all right? What I would do is take this ball and place it in the left hand and tap it with the wand very slowly and it disappears, okay? Once we've done that, we take the second ball and place it in the left hand and tap it with the wand and once again it disappears. Mm. I'll show you again with the third ball. Remember, all you do is you take it and it disappears quicker than Prince Andrew in a chorus line. <laughs> Vanished. <laughs> Are you following this? We'll start yeah, again with the there. three balls no, no, no. and the three cups, <laughs> all right? Okay. Are you following this? Okay, yes, sir. we'll do it again. <laughs> We'll just take this ball and place it in the left hand pocket okay once we've done that we'll take this ball and place this in the left hand pocket and with this ball we'll do a thing called the elevator ball that's where you take the ball and you drop it and it travels through <laughs> it's called penetration all right what actually happens is the ball travels through okay we'll do that once more and what actually happens is the ball travels. are you following this we'll start yeah, again with three it. cups and <coughs> three balls okay yeah, now, <laughs> okay. If, if i place if I place this ball underneath this cup and this ball over here, this is the ball we don't need. Now, with this ball, I will take it. And a lot of people say that when I do this trick, I place the ball in the left hand and do a strange thing, and it's not really there, but it's over here. Mm. You'd be quite correct in some ways. But if I actually took the ball and placed it in the left-hand pocket, or the right-hand pocket, should I say, and give the pocket a flick, the ball travels through and appears underneath the cup. Now, I'll, I'll do that know. again. <laughs> I'll take the ball, I'll place it in the left-hand pocket, give mm. a flick, and when you flick, all three balls are under the oh, center cup. <laughs> now, what we'll do is this is ball number one, ball number two, and ball number three, okay? Yeah. We have three balls. I'll place them into the right-hand pocket. Now, which cup would you like the balls to appear underneath? I'd like them all under there. Correct, but it changes into a lemon, oh, all right? Come. And this one is a lemon, and this one is a lemon, and this one is a lemon, and what we have is three lemons, all right? For the last eight weeks, I've been all over the country asking people trivial questions, and some of you have found them difficult. So, seeing as this is the last show in the series, I decided to make them very, very easy. Who wrote Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? No idea. Who wrote Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? Oh, I'm not that up to date in that stuff. Can you tell me who wrote Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? Tchaikovsky. What's the surname of the Nolans? The surname of the Nolans? <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote the collected works of Tennyson? I don't know. Can you name any of the group? Dave D, Dozy, Beaky, Mick and Titch. No. What year was the 1812 overture about? <laughs> you got me again. You're not cutting me on here. Yeah. And what year was the 1812 overture about? I don't know. Where did Helen of Troy come from? Troy. He's correct. <laughs> Silliest so far. Now, have you ever wondered where all the bits and pieces come from that you see dressing the sets in television programmes? These items, which cover periods from Stone Age to Space Age, are called theatrical props, and that's short for properties, that is, the property of such and such a theatre. Now, Robert Bent of Hamilton asks, where do film and television props come from? Well, Billy went down to a warehouse in Batley, West Yorkshire, to find out. God, 
bet you the soup's good here. You there, Leon? Hello, yes. What, what can I do for you? Oh, there you are. So that's what happened to the mother-in-law. Leon, we've had a question from a viewer about props. I believe you've got quite a few. Well, uh, with five warehouses here, it's a wonderful prop, yes. Could you show me around? I don't see why not. Yes, it's a pleasure. Let's yeah, go. OK. So, so where, where exactly are we now, Leon? What's this? Well, uh, <coughs> this is the middle floor of the third warehouse. We call this the shop warehouse. Uh, as you see, this is a com absolute, complete, mid-Victorian grocer's shop. I bought it about, what, 16, 18 years ago, in situ, and dismantled it in sections. It's all here. So the companies don't use just use the stuff you've got. Sometimes they'll use the whole thing as a complete set. Oh, it's, it, yes, it's, it's actually been to America. I, I'm block uh, by Walt Disney's. The entire lot went over to America and back again. Because um, it's not all from the early Victorian, because there's some stuff there that I remember. Ah, and I'm pretty young. Now, it is a mid-Victorian. I bought it in a mid-Victorian. But, you see, my business is props. Mm. And, uh, for instance, if you wanted the 1950s Nescaf tin, I have one. And if you wanted the uh, HP sauce, of, they keep altering. Yeah. And even now, we're, put, we're putting plastic things away for when I've gone and somebody else has got this business. You see what I mean? Say what, we're now just props. You made the ciggies a lot bigger than they used to need. Not that I'd be all right with that. Not that a cough smoke in a pack of them, wouldn't you? Mm. You yeah. would, you would. This looks like a stuffed Bilotti. <laughs> <laughs> when did yeah. you last hire him out? Uh, about a fortnight ago, he came back from uh, Granada. It was on Coronation Street. Huh? That must have been when Mike Baldwin was off. It's gone on the stairs. Oh, yeah, okay. Steady, does it? Watch out. Drops all over the place. Yeah. So, Leon, what's the most unusual item you've ever been asked for? Well, I would say uh, that goes to uh, BBC One Manchester, one by one. The head buyer phoned me, Leon, he says, can you get me out of tool? Have you got an elephant skull? <laughs> and he was surprised. I says, we have one, yes. Yeah, eyes open. I'm told that's normal with this drug. Oh. In the 1930s, a wealthy Methodist miller, Joseph Arthur Rank, began making religious instruction films. From these small beginnings grew one of the greatest names and most famous trademarks in motion picture history, a trademark which gave three men screen immortality. The career of former heavyweight boxing champion bombardier Billy Wells took a swing in an entirely different direction. This certainly gave general film distributors, as it was then called, a strong identity, but surely Billy Wells couldn't last forever. Alan Birdsall from Liverpool is intrigued to know exactly how many people have struck the famous gong. Well, Alan, by 1947, the original... Another worn negative meant a new symbol was needed, so the search for Gong Man number three started at Pinewood Studios. I was working at Pinewood Studios at the time when I had to supplement my income as an amateur wrestler, and that's why I got involved in uh, film work. At the time, J. Arthur at Rank were looking for a new trademark. They had to reshoot the uh, trademark. They obviously wanted someone with a good physique, and therefore they approached me and asked me would I be willing to carry it out. Of course I would. When I see myself on the screen today in something that was done 30 years ago, I'm inclined, like a lot of my friends, to say, ah, oh, there's Ken Richmond, I know him.
<laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Four hours' work and 30, 30 years preserved on film. It means that I've made more appearances than most people. Little did I think I'd be striking the gong again, so, well, for old time's sake, let's just do that. So, Alan, there have been three gong men so far, but of course, sooner or later, they're bound to need a fourth. So, we thought we'd audition some suitable candidates here and now before your very eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, Fax proudly presents the 1986 Eurovision Gong Contest. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, save your applause. We would like you to adjudge the winner by the volume of your applause. This will be monitored on Hilda Plant's hearing aid. So, let's have the first contestant, contestant number one. The man behind the mask is Carl Bright of Stockport. Off you go, Carl. <laughs> Carl is an antique dealer. Carl is an antique dealer, and here he is, going for a goal. And next, contestant number two, contestant number two is Paul Cook of Levenshume. In real life, Paul Cook is a chef. Well, I wonder what he's been cooking up tonight. Nothing too spicy, we hope, otherwise it may be a case of gone with the wind. Oh, dear. That's torn of Paul. And contestant number three is Gary Milnes of Manchester. In real life, Gary is an aircraft fitter. And to see anyone fitter than him. Pathetic, Gary. <laughs> Contestant number four is John Davenport of Bolton. I think you better set off early. I'm not sure you're going to make it. <laughs> John, John is finalist in the Mystic Universe contest, also a structural engineer. This is a little bit of structural work on himself. And John, it's a case of here today and gong tomorrow. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome contestant number five. He is Terry Holt, and he is from Oldham. Terry... <laughs> Terry is a professional kissogrammer, and in that job, he'll certainly get to Oldham. OK, Kerry, going, going... Gone! Right, I think we have a winner. I'm sure they're very nervous, very anxious to find out. Well, lads, I shall re announce the winner in reverse order. It is, in fact, Holt Terry. Yeah. Terry Holt, here he comes, here he comes. Well, well, well. Yes, I can see the ceiling over there. You must be very, very excited. Oh. You've got a very exciting year ahead of you. Yeah. What are you looking forward to most? I'm looking forward to meeting lots of people and travelling to faraway places like Bangkok and Hong Kong. <laughs> and banging your gog all the way. Well, Hilda, would you please present his prize? He's a man from Kissagram. I think you ought to grab on oh. whilst you can. Ladies and gentlemen, oh. Mr. Gong 1986. <laughs> An event that will truly embarrass the rugby club. It's trivia challenge time, and it's your last chance to get your own back on me. We've got several callers on the line with their questions on the subject of science fiction. And as usual, if they beat me, they win, and I've beaten Billy Plastic Hammer. And of course, to keep score, in fact, we just received a belated letter from President Marcos to say thank you to Hilda for helping count the votes in the Philippine election. Oh, thank Isn't that you. Nice thank you. Love it. <laughs> Well, Terry, would you plug the first caller in love? Switchboard's just there behind you. Yes, Billy. That's it, thank you. And our first caller is Brian Prince of Staffs. Hello, Brian. Hello there, Billy. Right, what's your question? Who played the Gemini Man in the series of the same name? It was the man out of Smith & Jones, wasn't it? Ben Murphy. That's correct, Billy. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> and Dawn Oliver of Staffs. Hello, Dawn. Can you please tell me... Who played Luke Skywalker in Return of the Jedi? Mark Hamill. Correct. Well, thank you. Yay! 
Thank you. And Neil Taylor from Starbridge. Hello, Neil. Hello. Could you tell me what the letters and numbers on the side of the USS Enterprise are you, you, the programme Star Trek? Are you, what you want is the numbers that are on the front of it, which is the licence number of it, so that the Captain Kirk goes to the right spaceship when he parks it. <laughs> is that what you want? Yeah. Fun? Yeah. Next caller is... <laughs> Do you know what? I've just forgotten that one, Neil. So what was it, Smart Alec? Uh, it was NCC yes. 1701. I remember it now. It's NCC 1701. <laughs> well, that's a plastic hammer for you, Neil. Thank you. Well done, son. Pauline Griffin of Sheffield. Hello, Pauline. Hello. Hello, Pauline. Uh, in Doctor Who, what do the letters of the word TARDIS stand for? Um, time and relative? Yeah. Dimension in space? Yeah. Thank right. you. Yeah. <laughs> well, Hilda, how did I do? Three, Billy. It's me worst so far, Hilda. It is terrible. Never mind. <laughs> well, on Tuesday, I asked you a question. Where did Mork of Mork and Mindy settle on Earth? And the answer was, of course, Boulder City. And the Studio Trivia Challenge table ended up looking like this. Which means that the Mersey Beaters, who got 8 out of 8 on their subject of cowboys, were the winners. And they're here to collect their prize. <laughs> and in the true tradition of great fax prizes, I'm very pleased to tell you, lads, your prize is a great one. You've won your own private box at Wembley Stadium, and here it is! <laughs> But we do have a marvellous fax trivia challenge trophy which Hilda would like to present to you. Here we are. Congratulations to the Mersey Beaters. <laughs> and that's all from fax. We've enjoyed doing the show very much indeed and we hope that you've enjoyed watching it. Yes, and many thanks for the thousands of letters and telephone calls we've received from you. And I know you're going to miss my cute face. And I hope you've taken part at home with my trivia tease and trivia challenge. You know, it's not always easy getting people in the streets to answer our questions, even though it seems to be. i will ask you a few questions about nursery rhymes, madam. Thank you. Thank just, you. just about nursery rhymes. I'm not in my car or nothing. Could you tell me any of the seven wonders of the world? No. Well, <laughs> well there we are. Can I ask you a few questions about nursery rhymes? No. Oh. What exactly is this fossil? Because I'm it's not allowed to be on camera. No, sorry, actually. it's a television show called Facts. It's just like an yeah. information type. I'm not allowed to be on that show, is it? Give a word for the mine. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. I, I'm not, honestly. I'm not allowed to be but on But do, do you know which gentleman put his cloak over a puddle? Just before you suffocate, can I ask you a question? Excuse me. Gemma. No, thanks. Can you tell me... <laughs> Do you any of the seven virtues? I'm not allowed to be on, sir, honestly. Well, would the traffic is... warden know any of the seven I'm, virtues? I'm not allowed to be on. Just one word, sir. No, no, no. Just no. about Robin Hood and Go Zellin. away, lad. London Plus tonight, the hospital beds crisis which has hit London spreads to Surrey. The 90-year-old woman savagely beaten in her own home and two-hour-old baby Ben found in a cardboard box. This is BBC One. The 
6 o'clock news from the BBC with Sue Lawley and Nicholas Witchell. Good evening, the headlines at 6 o'clock.